So this is going to be a little um, odd to some people. They always see public figures as one thing or the other. And I am a multiple of things. You know, I'm a big supporter of poetry, hip-hop, comedy. I'm a big supporter of so many different, well, obviously political things. I care a great deal about the Palestinian plight. I care about the guns in our communities. I spent my whole life fighting the NRA. I care about the factory farming industry, which is poisoning our communities. And I had an impact that I'll forever be grateful that I was able to have on the way that they process chickens at KFC and in the United States. I care a great deal about the prison industrial complex. I was lucky enough to get people out of jail and I was an activist in many other areas, women's rights, gay rights, all these things. And of course, I was in hip hop, really in hip hop. And today, I want to just say a few words about hip hop because I gotten calls in the last two days from three hip hop historians. And the last one was Daytuan, and the other one's like really intellectual, like writing about hip hop as if it was, I guess it is, such great piece of history and it's being documented now and sometimes it's being misrepresented or represented one side but left out the other. So the argument yesterday that Daytuan called me about was about uh, this woman said that Hollywood never played for younger audiences and therefore he wasn't hip hop. And I keep talking about Hollywood because the man's still alive. Eddie Chiba is dead. Lovebug Starsky is dead. And Hollywood is still alive and should be celebrated. And I've said this so many times, but I want to, the argument that he called me about, which I thought was odd that everyone's not clear on, but certainly the history books won't be if they're not. If the historians are not clear on the history, when these people died and that's fucking it, it will be misrepresented. Now, to say that Hollywood never played for a hip-hop audience would be like to say, or he's not hip-hop, would be the same as to say that Kendrick Lamar is not hip-hop. Kendrick Lamar is fucking hip-hop, ain't he? And so is Hollywood. Hollywood was a rapper. He didn't break dance. In fact, he didn't want to play for breakdance audiences. He was forced to. They said he never did. He was forced to in many occasions, especially uh, on a number of occasions where he was brought to my parties. Uh, and I booked him, and then I ended up mixing the crowd. I would have Queens DJs like DJ Herculock and Cypher Sound, and even Woody Wood would appear at some parties that Hollywood appeared at. And they were younger, and their crowds were younger. The price ticket for those people were usually younger, but they were now graduated by me to play in a crowd that was mostly dominated by Hollywood fans. So we'd have a big crowd. In fact, I had Hollywood play in an audience that I remember in the Hotel Diplomat on 43rd Street where he came in and cussed me the fuck out. I paid him. And he just went out there instead of doing that a word for the wise on tranquilize, mind your body and soul, got this brand new rhythm now, I'm gonna make it take control, let's do it. And the crowd go, let's do it. He would say, right now, mama, in your neighborhood, yes, once again, it's Hollywood. And he would rap maybe over Evelyn Champagne King to be real. But when he saw the crowd, he said, what do you get when you bust a nut? Super sperm. And people broke dance and people smoked dust and all the shit he didn't like. But they were uh, not really old enough, but we had a bar. Hollywood liked to play for the bar. And instead of playing for gangsters, the Casanovas and some of the gangsters that would come to the parties like Grandmaster Flash and other Bronx DJs, he played for drug dealers who were wealthy in their world and they would buy drinks, and the bar guarantee would be, that's what I would hire Hollywood, because I wanted to get money. They paid $6.50 to see DJ Hollywood. They didn't, it wasn't a dollar in a high school gym, but I used to rent them too. High school gyms and give parties, and those parties would have younger hip hop audiences and younger hip hop DJs. You know, people who were stars in that world. Grandmaster Flash, I graduated him to the Hotel Diplomat because he was so big and the younger audience, it was time for him to play an older audience. So he did and Eddie Chiba performed. Eddie Chiba, for that matter, is hip hop as well. The crowd was younger, but it was old enough to get in the Hotel Diplomat, which was $6.50, not $1. And Starsky kind of played the bridge. He played both all the time. He would get into 371 with Hollywood and Chiba, which was the club with the older rap 
uh, rappers. And then he played the Harlem Renaissance for a dollar every single day. A dollar. A thousand kids would come out every day. So there was this. But the argument that the greatest rapper that ever lived, or the most, in an era where hip-hop was being born, the one who was most innovative and the greatest performer and who had the biggest audience, and he was by far the biggest star. He had a red Cadillac. He'd drive it through your neighborhood, and you were the star of your neighborhood, and you were a rapper, or you were a DJ. You were great, and you had a big park following, and you could play in a high school auditorium, maybe even an armory, you'd be part of a big show. But Hollywood would drive his red car through your neighborhood, his red Cadillac, and they would chase it like it was Mr. Softy truck. So that's who Hollywood was. And when I, you know, one day when they're doing hip hop history, I hope that maybe this video or maybe my words will help to document the truth. Because any 70 year old in Harlem or the Bronx who was around at that time will confirm that Hollywood was the greatest. And he was, yes, he was hip hop, he played older, cooler, gangsters. Not gang bangers, but gangsters. So Jack and all of the Callie and Supreme and Fat Cat and all of the Gusto and Heartbeat and all the drug dealers, they're all gone now. Eric Von Zip, all these, they would show up and watch the great DJ Hollywood, along with a lot of people who could afford and who could get in to the club, 371, or to the Hotel Diplomat, uh, Giant Ballroom, or wherever Hollywood played. I share this with you so you can hold it, maybe. There's such thing as history and archives. And although they've demonized me now, my truth will, I don't want to. And they'll tell my story and they'll tell Hollywood's story. This is Hollywood's story today. And I wanted to share it because Daytuan, uh, thanks for calling and trying to document it. Take this with you not only Dave Twan, but all of the hip hop historians. Nobody, as Will Smith said, <laughs> remember Will Smith said, nobody, Charlie, is bigger. Nobody was bigger than Hollywood. Nobody contributed more to making rap records than Hollywood. And God bless Eddie Chiba, he was right under Hollywood and right under him was Lovebug Starsky. And then, of course, the Grandmaster Flash and Melly Mel and some of the other great rappers and early pioneers contributed immensely to what we now uh, celebrate as a worldwide phenomenon. But I hope when they write the history, that the history is not my hope. This is this will be held on my, I'll put it on Instagram and someone will save it and somebody who's paying attention, a hip hop historian will have this and I will have said it. Um, I'm gonna need a second and calm down and today, like every day, I'm preparing to meditate, but I wanted to get this off my chest because I slept on it, and I thought it'd be good to document it, my words about the great DJ Hollywood who still lives. So as they're raising money to give to what they say, the pioneers, raise some money. Oh, when I, we'll take care, let's take care of Hollywood. Let's give him his compensation and credit for what he's given to the culture. That's it. Have a beautiful day. Namaste.